Welcome to Smash Over Property. Today is the first of a new mini-series that I'm calling Tips from the Experts. My plan for this series is to talk to industry professionals who have a wide range of experience, seeing the best and worst case scenarios and help us make better informed decisions when it comes to property investing. It's all well and good to hear success stories from our generation, but because property is such a long-term game, it's also very important to hear from the experts. They've been around for a little while longer, watch multiple property cycles roll out, and give us some insights on what type of assets have performed consistently over time. Today, I'm very excited to talk to one of my biggest virtual property mentors, Chris Bates. Chris is a financial advisor and a mortgage broker who runs his own company called Wealthful. Chris is also a co-host with Veronica Morgan on another successful property podcast called The Elephant in the Room Property Podcast. Chris talks to us about the common misconceptions in the property game, taking a 60-year approach when selecting an asset and how the lending environment has changed over time. Right, but at the moment, probably lucky to get six to seven by salary. You've got a much smaller opportunity. And what that means is you've only got so much firing power. So do you really want to go and waste you know, half of that or three quarters of that on four assets or just buy one really top quality one. As always, seek your own professional financial, legal and property investing advice for your current situation. Everything we talk about is just our opinion and general in nature and should never be considered as personal advice. So without any further ado, let's get house hunting with Chris. Chris Bates, welcome to Smash Over Property. Good to meet you. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. No, no, anytime, mate. This is a, a real pleasure of mine because I'm not sure if you know it or not, but um, you're a bit of a virtual mentor of mine. And uh, I'm a massive fan of your podcast and literally listen to every single episode and you know, wait for every Monday morning for the new one to come out. And uh, I've definitely taken away a lot from your podcast. And I think I want to sort of relay that onto the, my yeah. listeners and, and the next generation. Um, and not only is that exciting for me, but this, this sort of series of, of podcasts is going to be dedicated to professionals in the industry who have seen some really bad worst case scenarios and some really good good case scenarios. So uh, I sort of want to walk through all those ups and downs and go through, you know, some things that people, younger people might not have considered before buying a property just so that they don't make a wrong decision or, you know, if even properties are for them in the first place. So cool. first of Foremost, you want to walk us through uh, a little bit about yourself. I mean, you're a mortgage broker, and and how long you've been in the industry for? Uh, so, financial advisor and a mortgage broker, I've been a planner for twelve years now, which is crazy. Uh, <laughs> Two thousand and seven, uh, been a mortgage broker for I think it's six, and uh, been running my own business for five and a half years. Wow. Yeah, that's awesome. And um, have you had a couple of properties yourself? Like what got you into property in the first place? Yeah, we've, we've got properties, but I think the, I mean, when you're working with all with younger clients um, and you want to work with young clients and help young people, um, property is their biggest challenge. It's what they're thinking about the most, what they're, whether it's just a home or whether it's, you know, a renovation or whether it's buying investment property. You know, it's a probably the best thing for young people to be looking at, other than say starting a business um, mm. or investing in themselves. They're probably the, the first, you know, couple of things you might think about. But you know, if you're looking to, you know, save and then invest, then you know, a lot for younger people, property makes a lot of sense. So since probably about 2012, 100% um, of our time has really been spent in edu is educating ourselves and our clients on on property and how to do it smartly. So my head's been hundred percent in that world for some time. Yeah, that's crazy. And from what I hear from the podcast, I think you do work with a lot of younger investors or, or uh, younger homeowners. Is that right? What, what sort yeah, of age group? With, yeah, we don't work with any clients in their fifties. I mean, <laughs> uh, um, you know, it's really kind of thirties, forties, couples and families. Um, and we have got clients who are in their fifties, but they might be, you know, one partner and, you know, there are other partners in their, you know, forties. Uh, okay. Okay. It's not, you know, if a couple comes to us and they're, you know, 55 and they're thinking about retiring, we just pass them on to other advisors. It's, um, it's not really for us. So, yeah. but we get clients, everything from mainly 30s, 40 couples and families, but, you know, occasionally we get singles and occasionally we get clients in their 20s as well um, who are kind of a bit more on the ball and are thinking about these things, which, you know, isn't most people in their 20s. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. And do you get a lot of people who have, you know, bought previously and they're kind of in a little bit of a pickle and you have to try and get them out of it? 
yeah, unfortunately, we see it pretty much every day. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's a hard conversation because generally, if they've already done a few things, you know, there's always a confirmation bias. We want to believe what we've done is right. And then there's also mm. ego involved um, where, you know, we can get defensive and, you know, but the reality is hindsight's easy and you, know, you don't only know what you know. And at some point in time, you made that decision and you weren't, you were just doing the best thing you thought was the best thing for you at that point in time. And now that you've got new information and you know more about things, um, you have to, to, to learn and grow as a person. We have to look back on our past decisions and see if we could have made better decisions. And, um, we can't go back and change them, but we can make a decision on going forward. And so, you know, we always uh, highlight if there's things people could have done which would have been better and educate why, because that's probably some of the best learnings. Yeah, for sure. And is is there a lot of commonality between the mistakes that they make? Like, I know you guys talk quite heavily about apartments and house and land estates and all that sort of things. But, it, I mean, are they the predominant two things that uh, young investors get caught up with and then come to you with, with the problem? Or what are the commonalities between them? So, you're right. There's usually just a few. There's one is um, probably buying a place that literally I was having a coffee with a client who uh was kind of like a friend um and he started seeing a new girl and um i'm just talking about it because it's just a recent story but what she was doing she was getting herself into a bit of a mess and he was like i'm not sure what to do here um she's inherited a lot of money um you know she's thinking i'm just going to go buy a one-bedroom apartment it's off the plan um and put all the money in and take no loan um and so off the plan, you know, buying something and sort of, you know, the stage of where she's at in life, um, you know, she wants to meet someone and settle down and have kids and she's trying to buy a one-bedroom apartment with all her money and doesn't really suit her stage of life. And whether that's a guy or a girl, the same situation would exist. Um, yeah. not, buying, not buying a place that suits them from a lifestyle point of view long-term. Um, B, buying an off-the-plan apartment. Um, in an area where they're building a lot more off the plan apartments. So that's, um, and then all the risks with building issues and supply. Um, we see a lot of clients, uh, you know, they've kind of gone, I want to get a number of properties. It's all about how many properties I, I own mm. uh, rather than the quality of the properties. And so I've seen you know, even young people with three, four properties, but you know, they're three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000 each. And, um, they're scattered all over the country in all random locations that they've read in, you know, magazines and things like that. And none of them have gone up in value. Some of them have gone backwards. Um, and they're sold with this positive cash flow dream. Yeah. Um, we, the house and land package is a prime one. Um, not only do they buy in house and land packages, but sometimes they buy townhouses that are, you know, they don't suit families in house and land packages. So um, they're pretty awful investments. Oh, yeah, there's lots of lots of mistakes you can make. Service departments, um, uh, studios under forty square meters. Um, yeah, the list kind of goes on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, I was always for capital growth, but one of the biggest takeaways from your podcast is um, the whole argument of capital growth versus cash flow. And you know, you you read all these books and you get sold the dream of having positive cash flow properties and they're going to supplement your income. But, you know, if you're aiming for the wrong thing, being cash flow and without any uh, potential for capital growth or even being sold an area that you're not sure if there's going to have capital growth in from a property spirit guy, it's easy to get caught into. Yep. The, the positive, it's interesting. We're going to get a lot of it next year. Um, it's funny because the positive cash flow thing is just going to go bonkers next year because of low interest rates. So everything positive cash flow. So. Yeah. And... Uh, you know, and the good thing is you can get quality assets, you know, houses and capital cities on good streets, close to the CBD, that are aspirational, not affordable. Um, they're not building any more of those. Uh, and, you know, potentially get a, you know, because of low interest rates, they can be almost neutrally geared, sometimes even positively geared. So, um, but yeah, the falling for the, the positively geared high yield um, properties, they're great if you're in your 60s and you're looking to retire and, you know, you just don't focus on capital growth. Even then, I wouldn't buy them. But, you know, if you really want that rental income, then maybe you do that. But 
you know, personally, even at that stage of my life, I'd buy shares. But um, <laughs> yeah, I think the whole positive cash flow thing is a really, it's a big myth. Um, and the problem is you have to pay tax on it anyway. Yeah. So even if you make $5,000 a year, um, you, after tax, it's $3,000 a year. Now, if that property is not going up in value, all you're making is $3,000 a year. Now, 10 years, you make $30,000. Like, it's nothing, you know, compared to if you bought a property and it's going up 3 or 4% a year, um, you can see why. Uh, and over time, your rent goes up if your capital value goes up. So if you price of the property doesn't go up, you can't put your rent up. Um, and so that's a big mistake with positive cash flow. Yeah, and I think it, it eats up your borrowing capacity, right? So if you've got two or three or four investment properties that are just all heavily positively cash flowed and then you know you, you decide that you want to go for a capital growth potential property and you've got no more borrowing capacity to buy it, it, it makes it impossible. And then you're in this big conundrum of having to sell off your old properties and potentially lose money and it goes down a bit of a cycle. Hey, It's a good point. It's a very good point. I think um, borrowing capacities in the past were kind of, People just thought, well, you know, if I want to buy another property, I just I can do it. You know, the banks will always lend me more than I want. And the reality is, it probably was like that. Um, so about 2014, 15, mm. you'd get 10 times salary. Um, so and potentially even more than that if you knew how to game the system. So, um, you know, a couple earning 200 grand, go and borrow two million dollars, and maybe even more than that. So, you know, they wouldn't really be able to. You know, if they wanted to buy another investment, probably they could just do that. You know? But at the moment, probably lucky to get six to seven um, mm. times salary. So you've got a much smaller opportunity. And um, what that means is you've only got so much firing power. And so do you really want to go and waste you know, half of that or three quarters of that um, on poor assets or just buy one really top quality one? Um, the other problem is as people's incomes go up, they get more capacity. So as soon as they get more capacity, they go spend it rather than potentially waiting a couple more years and getting mm. a lot of property and then go and buy one really top quality property. So, um, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> and on that as well, like, uh, I mean, I've, I've been a culprit of this in the past is like you, you find out what your maximum borrow capacity is and you want to go and borrow that full amount and buy a property for as much as you possibly can, where you're actually better off from what I've heard from you guys is, um, you know, assessing what a good investment property is. You don't have to go and borrow your maximum and spend your maximum, but have some extra, you know, equity or firing power ready for you when you want to go again and wait for the market to come or wait for a good property to come up again. Yeah, you want to... Um, if you've got more capacity than you need to get a top quality asset, that's a good problem. Um, it doesn't mean you should always just go use it all. Um, you know, so there's always sweet spots um, and price points that I think you probably, just because the higher, more that you spend, doesn't mean your rent <laughs> or yield is going to go up just as much. So, you know, I like talking round numbers, but these are big numbers, but say you're going to buy something for $2 million, it's a house. Um, you might only get $1,200 a week rent for it. Um, but if you went and support something at 1.6, you probably could get 11.50 a week rent. So for me, I'd probably go for the one that's probably a bit cheaper, a little, still got the same amount of rent, just because it's a little bit better yield, a bit better, easier on the cash flow. Potentially there's more upside in it as a percentage as well, and then leave more in the tank. So you just gotta, it's not a case of always just trying to spend everything you've got. But unfortunately, most people are in the other, situation they want to spend 1.3 they've only got a million and they're considering do i spend a million or do i wait or that's mm. the yeah yeah fair fair enough and uh, yeah. as you were saying before with the example with the one bedroom apartment i mean um property really is a 5 10 20 year game or forever if you can hold on to it and i think a lot of people get caught up in you know, buying what, what suits them now for their current conditions, but don't plan for kids in five or 10 years time. And, you know, they don't go for that second or third bedroom to accommodate for it. Is, is that a, a big issue that you run into most of the time if people want to upgrade, but then have to sell and rebuy again to do so? Yeah, that's a good point. So you don't, um, you should always think through where your life's going to go first. And the biggest challenge of that is your family situation and Know, meeting a partner and just having kids. If that's not for you, that's fine. But at least you've thought, thought that journey through. Um, or if it might happen, it's never nothing certain. So it's just 
you know, if it if it could happen and you would like it to happen, then you, you should try to start to factor it into your decisions today um, and plan around it. So you know, and maybe you buy that future home, even though you're only single and you're, you know, you're not going to live there for another ten years. But maybe you buy that future house rather than buy a one bedroom apartment decision. So that's kind of something to consider. Um, yeah, I think there's a second part to your question, but I. Um, yeah, just planning for the future, like a, having a, a five or a ten year goal, or, or looking at the the capital growth now. Yeah. Yeah. So you said probably is a five, ten, twenty year game. Um, I kind of it's a good start. I'd probably even flip it further than that. If you're a lot of your listeners and are in their twenties, let's call it. Um, really, it's a sixty year play. Mm. You know, so that's crazy. But you know, really. If you think about it like that, you think, well, what property am I going to buy today that's going to be super scarce in you know, 2080? Now, um, scarce people would talk like this, but that's the right mindset. So the reason I say when you're 80 um, is because, you know, generally most people will work to their 50s or 60s. Um, then when they retire, they're going to be working for 30, 40 years. So they're going to have built up quite a lot of super. Um, you know, ideally max that out if you can. So when you get to 65, let's say you stop working then, you can have super that'll last you another 15 years, maybe last you more. And then that's when you sell your property is when you start to run out of other cash. So it could be, you know, 60 years. So <laughs> if, you, if you take that type of mindset, you really f- focus on the foundations of supply and demand and what's scarce and buy things that are going to be even more scarce and desirable and, Years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I mean, on that, like, what what are some of the some of the blindness that our generation have when they come to you? Like, is is do they they come to you raging with a, a property that they found on realestate.com and say, "I want to buy this," and then you've got to find all the reasons not to? Or uh, uh, do they generally come to you with good properties? I mean, what are what are the hardest things to sort of deal with with your clients? Um. It varies. I mean, a lot of people who come to us have been listening to my been on the podcast. They might have been reading stuff on LinkedIn. They might be client referrals. So we get um, we get a bit of a mix. You know, we occasionally get clients who are super, super on the ball, like amazing. Just you know, they come. I've been looking at these properties and they're thinking about lights and parking, and street and supply, and like super educated. And I, just, I love it, but. You know, we also get clients coming and they're thinking about doing all sorts of random things. Um, so, yeah, it's always a journey and it's just taking people through that process. Sometimes it takes three, six months for people to to let that sink in um, and, you know, speak to a few people. I've had clients who have, um, you know, just decided not to go down our service and decided to follow something else and then come back years later and say, Look, I know that you were saying that. I get it now. I understand that, you know, granny flats aren't the right option. I understand buying high yield things in Southeast Queensland aren't a great option. Um, but I just didn't understand that at the time. So, um, yeah, it, there's lots of, uh, yeah. Little bits and pieces that they got to get caught up in. Um, and and do, do most people come to you with a goal? Like, do they have, do they, do some people come to you and say, oh, I want 10 properties in 10 years or, you know, I want to buy a really good investment property that's going to last forever. I mean, what sort of vary of goals do you get there? Um, I, I'm not really a fan of those type of uh, money type goals. Um, mm. You know, I think they're kind of, there's never an end. You get 10, you want 20, you want 20, you want 50. Like you you want a bigger house. As it's, to me, those type of goals are, uh, it's always a moving target and it's not really fulfilling anyway. I think yeah. that's the that we try to encourage it, the things around what they want to do in life and the type of life they want to live and who they want to do that with. And, uh, most people still want to get a home. They want to have family and they want a community and they want to live in an area that gives them lifestyle benefits. Um, so they want to be somewhere, you know, aspirational, I guess, um, rather than something that's just affordable and that'll do sort of thing. Um, yeah. So we always try to uh, facilitate that because I think it's really important that part of someone's world is a happy home and something that gives them and inspires them and things like that. So 
we get other people who are looking to, you know, uh, transition over time from working to businesses or, um, you know, are wanting to build wealth because they want to do things. So, but, you know, that's the whole kind of let's get rich fast sort of thing. Um, yeah. Can't we kind of, you know, debunk that a bit and say, you know, what's the rush? Let's do this properly. Yeah. Um, let's do it right. Um, and let's do something that will last you 50 years, not just so you can say you've got five properties in five years' time. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's a it's one of my biggest cruxes with the industry. Like everything we report on is, you know, our biggest barbecue conversation is, oh, how many properties do you own? Not how much in property do you own? So, you know, you can have 10, $100,000 properties and have a million dollar in properties, or you could have two really good assets of $500,000 and still be in the same boat. You know what I mean? But you're going to end up both very differently in, in 10, 20 or 60 years time, as you say. Yeah. I, the ones who've got the most are usually the ones who are doing the worst. Um, <laughs> You know, it, it really is. Like I've seen thousands of portfolios. And, you know, if someone says to me, I've got six properties, you'd think that my eyes would light up and I'd be like, great, great client. It's going to be amazing. It's, there's generally a lot of unwinding. I've had clients who have gone from eight properties to one property and then back up to two or three properties um, because it just wasn't working. Yeah. And that's happened quite a lot. So, um, yeah. And it's usually one property that's done all right in their portfolio, and that's allowed them to go and buy eight properties. The yeah. one property that's in is just a you know, house in Sydney or Melbourne that's doubled. And that's created <laughs> a million dollars of equity. They've used that equity and gone and bought seven you know, pretty average properties. Um, then they might have thrown in one really bad property, like a mining town, or yeah. um, that, that's kind of destroyed their whole portfolio. So. Um, yeah, don't, don't ever get impressed by the number of properties. Um, yeah, the most ones who have done the best have kind of got, you know, maybe two or three, maybe four. And they're like, they've been doing it for 10, 15 years. Yeah. Like, um, even if you've got three or four properties and you've only bought in the last five years, yes, you might have done all right if you timed it. But how do those perform over the next 10 years? That's that's when you start to see uh, the ones who have done really well up. Yeah. And at a very high level, I know there's lots that goes into it, but what, what do you kind of look for for an investment potential of a property? Uh, it's always about managing the downsides. It's always about thinking what could go wrong, what could change, what should. It's always about understanding supply. Um, yes, you can always get excited by the growth, but the growth comes because you think about the risks. So, you know, uh, from a supply point of view, can they build more of them? Is this something that's actually scarce? Well, you know, a house and land package isn't scarce. You know, you can just, you know, just reading today, Scotland's just going to spend another 100 million buying, you know, massive farms in the north of Melbourne, right? It's going to be 1,400 house and land packages. So, you know, that's just going to happen. Keep happening, 100, 100 million, another, another 1,500 houses. So, house and land packages very rarely are scarce. They might be scarce in 50 years' time, but, you know, not anytime soon. <laughs> um, same as apartments. Can they build more apartments? They're the same as yours, yes. So you just just avoid them. They're just not great investments. So um, you know, good properties really suit home buy. Then you go demand and you just think who, who really wants to live in this property, who wants to own it, not just rent it. Who wants to who would who would go to a bank and borrow money to buy this property? Or if they've got cash, would buy it. Um, and so with downsizers, you know, older generation, singles, couples kids um, you know high income couples who work in the city would they want to live there would they would they you know and so it's just go think for all the demographics that want to live in the property um, and the more the better if you can tailor if your property suits everyone that's great but it's not generally going to but the more the better but if you're going to hit target one target that double income high income family because um, they generally all because that's and then think about land component land's what goes up it's not the house. The house is like a car. It goes down in value. So you want to get a lot of land. Not a lot of land per se, but a lot of your money in the land. Um, so if you buy something for a million, you want the land to be worth, say, seven, eight hundred thousand, I think. Um, and then you can overlay, like, building things. So, you know, you've got a house. But is, not every house is equal. Um, so one side of the street will generally perform worse than one the other side of the street. 
because this one might be all north facing backyards, get all really good light. This one could all be a bit dark. Um, not as enjoyable to sit out the back of the house and have a barbie or you know, put a pool in or whatever. Um, then there's parts of the street that would do better than the others. So it might be a bit of a hill, um, which creates a bit of an aspect. It could be um, part of the street's got privacy issues with apartments or too noisy. So it's even in the best streets, you've got to pick the best parts of those streets. Um, and then even like the house could be next to a neighbour that's horrible, ugly looking house or a mechanic or something like that. <laughs> um, and so those houses, even though it's a great street, north facing on a hill, it's next to a mechanic, you know what I mean? So, yeah. um, you know, this is a bit of a wild example, but yeah, there's so many overlays you need to go through, but that's the scarcity of the property when you come back in 10 years is where those small things add up to a lot of difference. Yeah, yeah, a lot of things over time all come together. And uh, talk to us about, um, you know, the, your favourite strategy that you put into play. So you were saying before about, you know, if, if an investor's only got four properties over 10 years or 20 years, it's, he's in the, in the best position or you think that he's in the best position he can be in. And is that sort of the strategy that you'd recommend for people is to um, buy properties slowly over time? Yeah, it's nothing sexy. Uh, buy a quality asset that is, isn't flawed in any way. Um, and all you need in there is population growth and income growth. And so uh, is Australia going to have bigger population in the future? Well, yeah, I mean, it's sort of highly desirable around the world and um, the world's growing and I think Australia's population will grow. Um, so is that going to be in Sydney, Melbourne? Well, yeah, probably because we're not really creating jobs on farms as much, creating knowledge jobs. And they're based in a couple of cities. So population growth, income growth. Um, and is it near the city? Yes. So just give it time. So would you want to sell that property in 2030? No, just hold it. So just, and the reason you hold it is because to trade, it's very expensive. Mm. Stamp fees, selling costs, capital gains tax, um, all those sort of things just buy into your return. So if you don't need to sell it, you've got a quality asset, you just hold it. Um, and so, yeah, get a few of those. You're going to cap out at some point. And then you just yeah. try, to, try to really manage your debt and your risk and your buffers because that's where you need to be able to afford to keep these properties. If you've got a few million dollars of assets, you've got to be able to carefully making sure that you're on top of your loans, managing interest-only periods, all your servicing. Um, and yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, one good house. Your house is a tax free asset. So you just need to get one property, ideally your most expensive property or your best property, um, growing tax free. So there's ways to do that. You just got to be always getting, don't miss the trick with that because tax free returns on a big asset is a lot of tax savings that um, you won't get unless you think about it. Yeah, that's that's a key one. That sort of yeah, principal place of resident or uh, tax free growing property, and uh, I love I love this strategy because um, a lot of the property spookers out there that say, oh, we can get you twenty properties in ten years, and then you sell you know ten of the properties and pay off the remaining ten of the properties. Um, that's their sort of like exit strategy and plan to get you out, or or you know refinance and live off the equity for the rest of your life and it's just you know from what i'm understanding and seeing it's just not possible and i love your strategy because really you should have an extra strategy in place but there is doesn't really necessary for one like you're not planning to sell off a property or or refinance you know refinance and live off the equity so what what sort of extra strategies do you put into play or at least you know inform your clients of doing so if you, you don't need to pay them off in retirement, you can have a loan, uh, you can get a loan at, who knows what loans will be like in 20, 30 years time, but <laughs> uh, we're, we're working longer, right? So um, the vast majority of the population will probably be working into their 70s, I reckon, in 20, 30 years time. Um, and uh, yeah, and if they are, then loans will be, you'll be able to get loans in your 70s. So, you know, if you think about a loan for 30 years, so when you're getting in your 50s, you know, it's hard if you've got a lot of debt and you're no longer working, you've retired or something, then if you can 
get a loan in your 50s for 30 years, which you can now, um, and you don't, there's no rush to pay it off, especially if you that property you purchased for a million and now it's worth, say, three or three million, right? And your loan was eight, a million. Well, and the loan of a million on a $3 million property isn't such a big deal in mm. you know, 30 years' time. It's very low OER. The rent's almost covering it. So banks should probably just lend almost on that property. So um, you don't need to pay them off if they grow because the rent in the, if you ever get into problems, you can always sell it. So, you know, um, I think that whole strategy is very flawed. I mean, other strategies you um, can look at, I mean, super's kind of commoditized. You can only put 25 grand in super. Um, it might seem a lot, but you know, over time, it doesn't you feel like you'd want to put more than twenty five in? So you should definitely try to get to your twenty five as soon as you can. Um, maybe after, maybe going and buying some properties. But um, yeah, other than that, then you once you've capped out with property, you can't really borrow anymore because of income. Um, you then diversify. That's generally in your fifties and late forties where you start to regular savings to share plans and you've topped out your super and might look to buy some other assets in your 50s like commercial property if you want and get higher yield and yeah, you know, what lots of things but they're kind of as you get older yeah right and as that portfolio grows and as you say max out your sort of borrowing capacity and then you can start to look for other options yeah so apart from the Elephant in the Room podcast, what resources would you recommend for young investors or, or even first-time buyers or anything to sort of just get a good understanding of what a, a good investment property actually is? That's a good question. Um, like, do you have any favourite? Yeah, I do. So I would definitely, without doubt, read Pete Wardens' blog. He's, um, I mean, I religiously read that blog. Um, Pete's an absolute, he's, I know he's a, he's a good friend as well, and I think um, you can't go wrong with reading his blog. Um, I mean, personally, I would kind of study what's happening with the state governments and infrastructure um, and what they're thinking at all the time. They can have huge impacts to property values and create opportunities. Um, and uh, just being aware of what state government's thinking long term might take once you've got the real base understanding of how the cities are built, what the state government, federal government are thinking, then you can kind of factor that into what you do. Um, it's not about trying to time it and buy where they're thinking about doing something. It's just about understanding how the cities evolve and how they change. Um, yeah, I mean, there's lots of good people out there as well. Um, lots of good buyers agents. You can go around and you can join all their kind of newsletters um, out there. Um, you know, understanding demographics, so Bernard Salt to the world, and um, if you understand how your population is growing and how it's growing, where it's growing, what are people earning, and you can see how our cities are forming, and that helps yeah. understand the macro story. So there's lots of elements to property rather than you know what's a good property. You do need to know what's happening, understanding what's happening at a macro level, and also what's happening at a, a bank level with home loans because that credit has a huge impact on the market. Um, what's happening with rates and where they're going, and what can you borrow and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, there's lots to take in, but it's, yeah. Yeah, that's cool. And I think maybe just to counter that as well, like what should we look out for to avoid? Like if, like how would we identify what a pr property spruker is? Um, well, if they've got any type of property to sell, that's a spruker. Um, you know, you don't. If they're trying to recommend some type of property to you. Uh, I can't think of how that would not be a spruik up. To be honest, um, you know, good. The only way to to be a, a good property, helping people buy a good property, is probably to buy something on the on the market, not something that's stock. Um, because that's where the scarce properties are and you can't buy them in a catalogue. You have to go out and wait for someone to sell it. So anyway, it's only people buying established property and if they can do it fast and they've got one ready to go, then that's a water sign. Um, it's actually really hard to buy established property because uh, they're actually quite scarce. You know, there might be five on the market at one point, you know, mm -hmm. they might all be just 
anyone who's saying buy this or I've got this or this is a good place to go or anything like that, it's based on research, just avoid. You don't need that. Go to someone who's buying established property in ideally capital cities. Yeah, I'm not sure if it was you or Veronica who said it, but um, I think you said, um, you know, if, if they're not getting paid, if you're not paying them in any way, shape or form, like where are they getting paid from? Like how are they earning an income? So just identifying, you know, it, it, who are they getting, for, are they getting paid from a commission from somewhere? Are they getting paid from someone else? And that really makes you stop and think, okay, well, if this guy's proposing to be a buyer's agent and I'm not paying him anything, but he's recommending these, you know, four brand new properties to buy off the plan, then, you know, where is he getting paid? What, 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 what is he using this time for to give me this advice from? Yep. It's very true. Yep. He's <laughs> <laughs> um, like, Oh, I bought this, you know, uh, new castle. It seems like a duplex in Newcastle. And um, I know Newcastle quite well because I grew up there and uh, <laughs> I was like, Oh, where, where is it? And, he goes, and I was like, Oh, I know where that is. And he's like, um, he goes, yeah, my mate's a mortgage broker and he, um, yeah, he introduced me to this guy. I said, well, I don't know, mate, he's not really your mate because, <laughs> yeah, I said, that's what I said. I said, did he get, did he get paid for that? And he goes, yeah, he got paid for that. I said, well, he's not really your mate. He's not, he's not helping you out here. Um, so, you know, you've got to be careful when people are getting paid to recommend stuff. It's too conflicting and it's usually the wrong idea. Well, it is yeah. always the wrong idea. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And um, just finally, would there be any other advice that you would like to give to probably, you know, first time buyers or, or younger investors? You won't be able to do it unless you work on your income. Property investing is not a, uh, it's not working when I want to live off my assets. Um, it just doesn't work like that. You need to invest in yourself, do something you're passionate about, uh, you know, constantly be educating yourself adding more value, doing what you, whatever you do um, and earning more money generally to allow you to do other things, which will allow you to do your, your personal goals. It's, it's not a means to the end. You actually will still need to go out and earn money and, um, and then potentially transition to a lead time. Um, it can't stop you getting out of work or anything like that. So keep investing in your income and what you do. Um, it's not about following money for the sake of money because that doesn't that's not going to make you happy so you need to do something you're passionate about and it helps people and things like that but you do need the income yeah cool perfect all right well thanks again for your time cool. here today chris no worries cool Enjoy. Pleasure, mate. Oh, cheers bye bye I hope you now see why Chris is one of my virtual mentors. He breaks property investing down to its simplest form. There's nothing sexy about it, it's a 60 year game plan and wealth creation doesn't happen overnight. If anything we talked about in this episode opened up a horizon for you, I would highly recommend going and checking out his podcast, which I'll leave a link for in the podcast notes. I'm always looking for more guests to come onto the show. If you're under 30 and have one or more investment properties, whether it's good, bad or ugly, I would love to talk to you about it. The main focus is to help other soon to be young investors with tips and tricks along the journey. Learn from the mistakes that we have made and ignite the fire to set themselves up financially for the rest of their lives. If you're interested in sharing your story, you can go to jordandeyong.com forward slash podcasts, where there's a podcast inquiry button at the top that will guide you through the next steps. If you're keen for more content like this, make sure you subscribe and please leave us a review with any feedback for future podcasts. And until next time, happy house hunting.